Welcome to another episode of the Information Addicts Podcast. My name is Cassidy. I'm an information addict, and this is my podcast where I explore information, ideas, and beliefs and try to do those things more responsibly. Today's conversation I have for you is with Dr. Timothy Petisis. I have talked about Dr. Petisis' book here before, uh, The Ethics of Beauty, and I, I reached out to him because I've been really excited about um, what that book has been showing me and shaping me and uh I don't usually talk to authors, but I really thought it would be interesting to have a conversation with him as it's influenced a lot of the things that I have been doing here on this channel. So I had a really good time. I hope you enjoyed the conversation too. <laughs> Timothy, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to speak with me today. Cassidy, it's nice to nice to see you again. Yeah, no, I'm I'm very excited about this conversation. Um, you know, I we we've planned this for a little while, so I've been looking forward to it. So I'm glad uh, we finally got the chance to sit down and talk a little bit more. Um, but before I get too into it, why don't uh, you give a brief introduction of yourself? Uh, who are you, and uh, what's important uh, for the conversation? And then I'll probably kind of talk about your story a little bit too, because I'd love to hear more about uh, who you are and what got you to where you are. <laughs> well, at, at the moment, yeah. So my name is Timothy Petitsis and uh, um, I'm from Northeast Ohio, originally raised there until I went to college. Um, at the moment, um, my job is um, the interim academic dean, the interim dean at Hellenic College, which is a liberal arts college. It's an Orthodox Christian college. It's also the undergraduate um, section of the um, Greek Orthodox Seminary in Boston, the grad school's Holy Cross. Okay. And then I guess people are, are interested um, because I wrote a book called The Ethics of Beauty. Yeah. Um, and it's, that uh, it, it really, it came out of, I'm also a professor at Holy Cross at the Graduate School of Ethics. Okay. Um, and in the context of teaching those classes, you know, I en ended up writing the book. Great. So, um, have you obviously you're you're uh, teaching at an Orthodox college? Have you always had an interest in Orthodoxy? Was that something you're raised in, or uh, was it something that you discovered? Yeah, I was you know a weird person. I I, I was. Um... You know, my my dad is from Greece, so so um, and my mom's dad was from Greece, okay. and I'm here in Greece actually. And there's a <laughs> picture of I don't know, I think it's my grandfather's sister or something oh. in traditional <laughs> clothing from the fifties. Um, and um, and so so I grew up in the faith, and you know had just had lots of questions about just everything, but I th I think too. And then my my older brothers and my sister were also very faithful people. I'm the youngest of six kids, so oh wow, <laughs> it's a large family. We, we had kind of an intense life because my my parents had an arranged marriage. They got married when my mom was 20 and my dad was 22, and my dad was an immigrant from Greece. And then they had six children in nine years. So we were all really just kids together in a way. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I see I see twenty year olds, you know, now in my seminary, and I mean, you know, at Hellenic College, it's it's young, and um, yeah. So everything was kind of intense, and everything we did, and questions of identity, and questions of faith, and family relationships. It was all. <laughs> and we had a great parish in Akron, Ohio, and we were very close to the people there, so. Yeah. yeah, everything was always on my mind. <laughs> yeah. And so did you ever have a time where you struggled with the faith or was it something that, you know, as you kind of grew up in this very intense family, it felt sort of natural and and easy for you? I mean, you, you obviously did a lot of uh, education and now teaching people about the faith. You know, I, I had uh, other people were struggling with the faith around me, and mm -hmm. I was I was I was a kind of a um, skittish, anxious young person, and I think I probably overreacted <laughs> with loyalty to the faith, um, and didn't uh, I didn't really go through that. But then the the other thing was I was uh, you know I liked school, I liked you know trying to be one of the smart kids at mm -hmm. school. 
and and then in 1982 so i was like 14 and my my brothers they they spent a semester abroad in greece and they met elder porfirios and they met elder paisios and mm. i i don't know if they also met um elder friend of katunakia i think maybe was he still living then they just met a, they met some someone he used to they, know, they met father Ephraim from at philotheo they met little Ephraim. sadly he died young he was the abbot at Xirobotamu. so Mm. When they came back um, that fall, and we really heard about elders for the first time, we, there was a monastery in our in our home county in Portage County, Ohio, St. John the Theologian and Hiram, and that had a big impact on me as a kid. But when when I heard about living elders, as someone who valued science and and learning, mm -hmm. that was kind of game, game over. Like there were no more doubts after that because. Mm -hmm it was clear that um, the, such men and women had access to some other way of knowing. Mm. And so kind of an irrefut irrefutable. Mm. Yeah. And so, so yeah. So, yeah. Oh, keep going. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, so I, I guess in a sense on scientific grounds, you know, that was like, no, these people somehow know things that aren't knowable. There must be other ways of knowing that are based in faith and that are based in belief in God. Mm. I, I think it would have been like, after that, to doubt the faith would have been like doubting physics or something. Like, what? <laughs> what <do you> would... <laughs> Phys physics is physics. A lot of smart people are trying to work it out and they're clear about what they know and what they don't know. And there's nothing to doubt there there's a this is some kind of a process yeah well, that's 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 really interesting yeah it's really interesting to hear that because there's yeah there is this sort of in the modern frame this like real trust for science and learning and, and this feeling like those things are incompatible but yeah that recognition of like oh well you know and being around churches enough you you get those experiences of of meeting people where all of a sudden you're like whoa there's maybe there's something to this other way of knowing <laughs> that uh... I'm fooling around my lighting. My lighting is bad. You look so so bright and I'm kind of dark. It oh. doesn't matter. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't matter for, for what my channel. Yes, a lot what, of people what, just like the, what, the good conversation. <laughs> what were you, what were you saying though? I, I missed part of it. Say oh, it again. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just saying that, um, that idea of that religious oh, oh. knowing of meeting someone and, and having that sense of, um, having this other way of knowing something with this respect to science, because there's a lot of this talk, like those two things are incompatible yet. Um, right. right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's, yeah, that for me was not an issue. The, when I got to Georgetown as a freshman, um, what my, my first semester, one of my professors was the great James Shaw. He was a, a Jesuit who was a legendary for decades and, and not just at Georgetown, but he had us read um, E.F. Schumacher's, uh, um, gee, what was the book called? It was either A Guide for the Perplexed, maybe? Mm. It was a short little book, mm. but he, he, he described there um, other modes of knowing and, and, mm. and the Jesus prayers in that book. So right there, in my very freshman semester at a Jesuit institution, I kind of had this, you know, some someone, two very respectable people. I mean, the professor and then E.F. Schumacher, um, kind of coming to these conclusions as well. That you know, something is going on with. There's faith isn't just you know just it's not just in the contents of a black box, right? But there is a um, some kind of a work um, in faith wh whereby discernment grows. Mm. So, so, so after that, it was just two parallel plot, uh, tracks of science for me. It wasn't really, yeah, that's. Yeah, no, no, I, I like that. It's very interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, well, and um, I guess this might be a good way to segue into your book. So I was actually gifted your book uh, by a priest. <laughs> yeah. I went to a friend's wedding. Um, it was actually my first Orthodox wedding in Oklahoma. And um, had a conversation with the priest and he gives me this book and um, he said, I think you need to have this. <laughs> and I, I read it on the plane and it was just like, um, from then on, it was like, 
uh, like totally eye opening for me. And I had already been looking at orthodoxy and was on my way to become orthodox. But the the way you framed <laughs> the the faith and the process of beauty in sort of coming to an understanding of like the the meaning in the world was um it just started to make sense for everything and I kind of got more of that confidence to walk in it without uh so much uh anxiety and and maybe I'll get into that a little bit later but um how did you come to write this book because in the preface you talk about it like you mm -hmm. didn't mean to write a book about beauty but here here it is a very thick volume <laughs> yes and 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 I'm and to, to all readers, you yeah, bring it on on your airplane flights and walk slowly down the aisle so <laughs> we can get a good look. And be, maybe I should buy that. Um, yes, how did I come to write the book? Um, well, it's it's because uh, so so a after every degree that I've finished, I've had a longer stay at an Orthodox monastery. So. Mm -hmm. After high school, I went to Mount Athos for the first time with my brother. Mm. We did, in fact, I think I, we did three trips that summer. Um, I had met Father from Arizona already when he came to Pittsburgh, when he came to the United States for the first time. Um, and then after college, I went to Mount Athos for six weeks. And then I took the, the, the big trip, which was <laughs> I went to see St. Sophronia of Essex. And I stayed there for a month. Um, and that was a huge impact. And then, I, and then no, when I finally finished so the same after the, the MDiv and then after the PhD, I spent almost two years, one full year in the monastery. And then the next year going a lot. And, um, and then I was hired to teach ethics. Mm -hmm. So I always had these two tracks in my mind, like, you know, one, a more secular account of knowing, and then more what you could see of, um, and, and meeting clairvoyant people, um, you know, um, and, and, and so, so I was always thinking, I mean, but especially once I started to, after that year in, in, in the monastery, after the PhD, especially like, what are they doing exactly? What, what, what is, <laughs> what is it? What is their kind of approach to know, to knowledge and to life and to faith? And so when I went to teach ethics in the fall of 2005 for the first time, I, I was totally foolish and it, totally foolish. God, forgive me, students, forgive me. <laughs> I should have just took Father Herakas's book and taught that book for a couple of years until I, I got grounded. But instead, right away, I tried to start formulating, um, you know, the principles of um kind of mystical ethics let's say mm. and, and i've always taught the course that way and how would you how would you define mystical ethics you know i think i would have been pretty vague about that and uh, <laughs> you know until recently if you ask okay for for orthodoxy you know what are what's the first principle of spiritual life well it's it's what is the principle of life in the holy spirit and so, so right away, that simplifies the question, right? And I don't know, I, I, different answers can be given, you know, re repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand or different things about love. Mm -hmm. but, but in the ethics of beauty, we'll, we give sort of an, another or an allied first principle, anointing is always dual. And in a sense, that's the first principle of, of spiritual life because this anointing is brought by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings you an anointing and that anointing always has this duality, which it simultaneously makes you a king and it makes you a sacrificial lamb. And it does those things together. Now, the second principle is that um, in, in what the book, you know, what Jane Jacobs called the guardian sphere of life, um, or in terms of gender for men, it's this principle of one man lost. All these will be saved. Only I shall be lost. And then th that's that all. That's how the twofold anointing is expressed there, or how it's captured. 
Um, and then in the trader sphere, the commercial, the economic sphere, the sphere of knowledge and philosophy and science and all that and academics. Um, and then that this corresponds somehow to the feminine office. Um, then the 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 way the twofold anointing is is captured is through unknowing of things and knowing of persons. So you so right very quickly you have a structure to the spiritual life that right that the two foundational principles of orthodox spirituality is all these will be saved only I shall be lost and I don't know anything that I might know someone that that's mm -hmm. the core of the, of the orthodox mystical path. You, you can express it more mystically, but, you know, to put it algebraically, <laughs> maybe that's a sin, but that's what it is. Mm. And now to live any of those things is just a kick in the head and it's your whole freaking life. And, right. you know, it takes 14, 14 years to assimilate grace. It's, mm. It doesn't, it's, it's like, you know, it's not a recipe, but it certainly is a grammar. Mm. Yeah, I'm trying to let that sink in. <laughs> Interesting. So um, I guess sort of like an introduction to the topic, like for someone who, you know, hasn't heard about it before, doesn't know much about orthodoxy. What would your introduction to this idea of ethics of beauty and the participation of that be? And sort of what is it, how does it sort of differ from our modern view of um, ethics and how we practice that sort of more broadly in the West? Yeah, yeah, those are good questions, and I, I, I never really know the answer. I think <laughs> the, the the book is <laughs> the book is about um, well, well, you, you know, so, so well, let's say what the book was about, I guess, and, and it's it's about the, the beauty first way right. of spiritual life, and at the conclude by the conclusion of the book by the end of chapter eight a mere 740 pages later <laughs> you, you get that we also ha do have a beauty first way within science mm. so okay so um now the book opens with the discussion of trauma yeah because it's, it's this question of truth first approaches to the soul you know are, are dicey Right. Dicey because they, you know, it is beyond the strength of the brother, as Saint Silouan scolded Saint Sophroni at their first encounter or their second encounter. Um, no, first encounter. Yeah, it is beyond the strength of the brother. We uh, we have a spirituality of supermen, this truth first, and ethics for supermen, and we're not supermen, and it's uh, and a lot of people. Most people will kind of rise to it, but I think it leaves them uh, wounded in a bad way. Mm. And a lot of people are just wrecked by it. And I think um, Beauty First has, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a mildness. It's a mild approach to the spiritual life. I'm not, I'm just rambling. I'm not making any sense. Can you help me? <laughs> no, that's okay. No, I mean, I, I, I get a sense of it because I have read a little bit more. I mean, I, I loved that you started with suffering because I think a lot of these moral questions and, and what we have wrestle, what we're wrestling with, independent on whatever side we fall on moral questions, it is doing, dealing with this idea of suffering. And, um, we see this pattern of that in the world <laughs> and we want to find a way to like heal it and, um, reduce it um but yeah there's this this mentality of like well we we get <laughs> to it by um truth and in sort of like a psychological or yeah like in psychology we do talk therapy and all of these things and there's something sort of beautiful about the way that you talked about um yeah the 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 participation of beauty in that where <laughs> almost to to help with the suffering it's not about acknowledging the truth of that suffering but joining that suffering with the person and like mourning that and like sharing the burdens of that, um, which is very interesting. Yeah. Don't, don't, yeah. Go oh. on, go on. I don't know. Is, is that, am I, am I understanding that correct? That's how I remember it. Um, or at yes, least like I, I piece think, of it. <laughs> I, think, I think that's how people take it. And I think that's how it's written. <laughs> the, um, 
you know, you know, the the um our our aesthetic sense is it is a cognitive sense. So so when we say beauty first, another way to put that that would be less, you know, less of a marketing flair, you know, would be to say that we emphasize other kinds of truth first. And um right like like the like um it's we're looking for some stable pattern recognition we're looking for some we're looking for a stability of setting in, in other in other words in order to heal we're looking to um to celebrate beauty and and beautiful pattern before we enter into certain moral questions and then and then this the kind of 30,000 foot view that 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 truth analytical side um has to grow out of the other two mm -hmm. especially where living systems are concerned they just cannot be so so, so besides father Sofroni, you know having this huge impact on my life the, the other person of course was jane jacobs and already in 1961 in the death and life of great American cities. And she writes this beautiful book about urban order. It's the best book ever written about why certain neighborhoods are vibrant and others aren't. Mm -hmm. It's never been equal, never been approached. It's it's the thing. And at the end, she says, you know, there's. let me just give you a rough history of science since 1600, modern science, experimental science, the real thing. And she says, you know, the first 300 years, we could do a certain kind of problem. The next 20 years, we rapidly gained the ability to do a second kind of scientific problem. But since 1932, so now we're, it's here, it is 2023. So we're nine years away from the centenary of this thing. Mm -hmm. So less than 100 years ago, and in her case, it was less than 30 years ago. No, yeah, it was less than 30. That we have um, the strategies and tactics and tools for problems in organized complexity to study living systems. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing that we could do as a society, or the simplest thing at least, would be to teach the existence of the three kinds of science to all our students and to, to demand that professors are clear about which of the three they're using and why. And then also to teach the strategy, the, the tactics appropriate to each. Mm. So, so when you're studying a living system, <clears throat> you don't need a, a statistical aggregate of a person's life. And you don't need this reductive, oh, you are OCD or you are this or you're that. Right. You, if those if those conditions are about to destroy a person, then that reductive insight is helpful, and you want to blunt it, you know, through meds or whatever. Okay. But in terms of the of the average person, um, what is needed is a an organically complex approach to the soul, mm. and and you have to know, you have to ask yourself when you're looking at living systems, you have to ask yourself what is working what is going well and you have to feed that you 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 cannot so 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 what i'm saying for the soul jane jacobs was saying for cities she says we, mm. we spent from 1949 you know you know we we had this urban renewal act we tried to wipe out blight try to wipe out then we had a war on poverty wipe out poverty mm. they both those things have just made it worse and worse and worse mm. And because economies and communities and cities and souls are living systems. So if you want to be a therapist out there and you're listening to this and you're offended by what I've written, go read chapter 22 first. But then understand what kind of science you're doing and don't, don't, don't lie, to your, lie to yourself. 
mm. and say, oh, I'm, you know, I, 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 I'm promoting healing. Okay, fine. Are you? Do you understand what are, can you list right now at the top of your head? What are the tactics? No, you can't. So go back. We have to redo our society in our, based on living system science. And one of the points, in a sense, you know, I could have not written The Ethics of Beauty. I could have just written uh, in praise of chapter 22. Okay. But, but one of the points of having written The Ethics of Beauty is so that when people go back to the science issue, it links up with just the whole human project. Yeah. So uh, before before you can like tie that to science, how would you say um, the difference is between sort of a beauty first mentality to ethics versus um, say a, a truth first or a goodness first mentality? Because obviously in the book, in the intro, you talk about the, um, yeah, tr truth, beauty, and goodness being these three fundamental things and how in modern times we've kind of put beauty on the side or off the table. Uh, I, I'd love I'd love to hear you kind of explain how, uh, what you see the differences in those are. So, um, well, let me say, let me give an example from farming and then I'll go straight to ethics. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly, what happened in our in our farming is that so this very this very statistical blunt approach to to um, you know increasing yields, increasing productions. Right. Okay, took right. over, and that statistical that kind of science, the the science of disorganized complexity, it matched up with problem the science of of simplicity, the two variable problems. So you look for this reductive answer throw more fertilizer, throw more pesticides, throw whatever. Okay, mm -hmm. so we know that using these two kinds of science, which were the two, first two sciences invented by the Enlightenment from 1600, by 1925, we had both of those down. And we thought that was the whole of science. So we've, we've destroyed everything with that, right? You can't find a tomato that tastes like a tomato. You can't, the, 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 you look at organically farmed fields, the soil sample and industrially farmed so soil sample. It's the same. It's dead. It's completely dead. And regenerative agriculture is a, is, is a beauty first approach. It, it is, it is patiently um, looking at the grammar of soil people who write about regenerative agriculture said look i did a whole degree i had you know two weeks on soil and an entire degree on ag so what's really happening that life processes in the soil what is what is the life that's trying to happen there and then augmenting that so mm -hmm. so when i'm in the states i try to get all my meat from G uh, gabe Br uh, brown's ranch in, in north dakota <laughs> to they ship it to you <laughs> So, so it, it's so clear. A anyone can see, right? If you, if you just, you know, go on YouTube and type in Gabe Brown and listen to a couple of his lectures, and you just like, okay, in an hour you get the whole thing. And of course, there are other people who are much go much deeper. But there's a whole constellation of people, and then there's, if you want, you know, the the real real science. And there's a, um, I don't remember her name as a soil scientist or chemist in Australia, but. Essentially, it's clear that the third kind of science starts with curiosity about what is hmm. and then has the attitude of, of augmenting and complementing and participating in those living processes. OK, hmm. now with, with ethics, it's like a little bit different, right? It, with ethics, it's like it starts with truth. In other words, we try to know what is our what what, what school of ethics are we using? and is it internally consistent? And then we take the ethical challenge and we apply that machinery to it and we kind of debate the outcome. Someone else might say, no, I have a different school of ethics, whatever, whatever. Okay, so so this is not bad. You know, uh, these things, you know, they, they do that well and they have a certain claim to 
objectivity in the sense that no one is referring to God or something. But the average you know, believer, let's say, they want to know what the saints think. Because they want to know, like the person who's involved in the process of moral life from the standpoint of trying to complement the internal process of the heart, the soil of the heart. What does the heart want? It wants greater communion with God. It wants to be of greater service. In fact, it wants to die for the world. So, so, when, so we tend to think when saints look at these moral issues, in other words, what humans should do, other hearts, what we ought to you know, sign up for and give our hearts to, that they're going to find ways that somehow augment those living processes in the heart. <laughs> okay. So that's why we want their answers. We want, we want to hear from them. We, we don't want to hear just the smartest guy in the room. Mm. We want to know, look, he's the smartest guy in the room and his tomatoes taste like water. I don't want to <laughs> eat that nonsense. You know, this person, supposedly not smart. There's so many different ways to be stupid and smart. We have to respect all that. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I talked too much. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I, I, I find it interesting. And I'm, I think I'm, I struggle a lot with this idea of ethics of beauty. I mean, because I grew up uh, <laughs> almost uh, what I would probably identify now as a Christian materialist, <laughs> you know, this belief in Christianity and, um, you know, that there was this uh, belief in something mystical, but I generally acted in the world much more materialistically and very much moved towards this truth first mentality of like, well, if I can figure out it's true, what's true, I can, it can show me what's good. And then, you know, you know, <laughs> I see beauty in it, but it quiet. wasn't, yeah. And, but it wasn't, yeah. um, yeah, it wasn't really sort of in my mind on, uh, as a part of something to embody and, um, coming to orthodoxy and recognizing that there is a, a very different perception <laughs> of how they participate. Like, um, you know, when, when I came to, oh, ask me questions, okay, well, how do I understand, <laughs> or well, what should I read about, you know, orthodoxy, how do I understand the faith? You know, you'd sometimes get like, oh, read a, read the saints, or, uh, you know, here's this experience of orthodoxy, but it was much more go to church and participate. And I see that now as this recognition of like, let the beauty of what the church and the liturgy does strike you so that it leads you and shapes you in this way that opens you up to uh, better answers of the good and the true. And there's sort of that beautiful um, like path, but, but I, I'm also a filmmaker. So there was always this artistic part of me that was drawn mm -hmm. to the beautiful and the recognition of the way that it shaped us and changes us and um, inspires mm -hmm. us. And, and seeing now, <laughs> you know, the, the idea that um, we're far more, we, I think as modern people, we speak with this truth first mindset, but we act much more in the pursuit of beauty and trying to find stories that are beautiful. Um, yet we don't have a good orientation of those transcendentals and the way they process. I think part of it is sort of this fear of the beautiful and this um, sort of belief that to look at something, to not trust the smartest person in the room, but look to the thing that shines beauty um, might be distracting. But I also feel like it's not the fullest sense of what you really mean by beautiful or or what you know philosophers mean by beautiful when they're talking about this as a uh, you know a fundamental thing of like a meaningful life. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> no, no, that, that totally does. And I, and I think in a one way to put that is, you know, beauty first is not the same as beauty only. Right. It's just saying, it's just saying that, um, you know, you want to cleanse your heart and you want to, um, you, you want to um, be curious about the patterns of living freaking systems. They're super mysterious and complex. Like it's hard to make sense of what is going on in any living system. <laughs> and, <laughs> and historically, you know, the, um,
like like for Jane Jacobs to to understand the living order of a city that was hidden, she went to the directors of something known as a settlement house, which don't really exist anymore. Settlement houses, it was an idea of the, I guess, 19th, late 19th, early 20th century that the way to evangelize in the city or minister to the city, maybe not even in a religious sense, was to create these, these dwelling units where people of different, like you'd get 10 families together of different classes and they're together so they know l larger what's happening in the in the you know they, they can know from each other what's happening at all strata of society mm -hmm. and, or they can rely on resources that one has or doesn't have but it was quasi-religious so somehow it is a kind of ministry and these ministers were the ones you know who told jane jacobs when paul farmer the great paul farmer now who, who died last year um went to haiti you know, he he looked and looked and looked, and finally he found you know a Haitian Anglican priest, and you know he he kind of attached himself to to him. Um, in general, you know, uh, religious people, older people, um, you know, they they develop an eye for how a living system is functioning, mm. and, uh, and then to learn it, you have to be mentored, mentored. And Father Sofroni thought didn't so Saint so he Father Sofroni noted that Saint Silouan never really had that mentor. Just just so happened that he didn't. Mm. Um, and he tried to to save other people from that. Father Sofroni did try to, and Saint Silouan tried to save Father Sofroni from that to be his mentor. So, so one of the tactics for learning living systems is you need a, a, a mentor who's been around longer. It doesn't have to be older, but it has to be, has been around or, or just maybe has a, a gift for the, the pulse of a particular living system and mm. can take you by the hand. And Yeah. Well, there's something about the recognition of like what actually happens in a living system that requires living in that system and participating in it. Like <laughs> there's 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 so much you can do of collecting data and trying to understand something. But uh, there's a lot of these problems where unless you're embedded in it, living it out and, and seeing the complications of it, um, you can't get the fullest understanding of what's actually going on. So that that makes a lot of sense to me in that that place where you, you almost need that um, person embedded in the thing longer to see the thing that you couldn't see uh, unless you had had that time and allows that uh, beauty or that uh, whatever that quality is of that living system that we're trying to pull out, um, become alive to you <laughs> in a way, you know, you may have never seen it um, without that, or, or it would have taken 20 years to, to see it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And th there has to be, um, for this kind of knowledge, has to be skin in the game. There has to be some kind of risk. Um, I don't know why, but th there does. And Yeah. Well, do you think that's hard in a, in a world that's uh, pretty risk averse? <laughs> I'm risk averse. I mean, I'm, 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 uh, you know, f definitely a child of my age and I, you know, um, it's, it's just, there's so much more on offer, you know, it feels like the whole world is at, is at your fingertips. And so right. it's hard, harder to settle down and harder to, um, there's some kind of a passage there, you know, between, um, It's like working for the working for the church or something. People often think that the church is dysfunctional or something. That they're dysfunctional and unprofessional or something. But it's not that way. It's really much more that you, it's a different kind of battlefield, hmm. and a lot of the rules don't apply. It's hard to it's hard, it's hard to know, and it's hard to know. It's hard to know when you're just lying to yourself, saying, "Oh, this doesn't apply," and when it. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, yeah. What were we talking about? I don't want to get on that. 
<laughs> yeah, the, the church is a very interesting dynamic system. <laughs> I mean, that that might be interesting too. Like there's there's a lot of people, um, you know, they're 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 losing a confidence in the belief of religion, like the the growth of secularism is growing. And I don't think it's actually growing in the sense that people don't believe in some higher power spirituality. It seems like it's more um sort of an undefined spirituality or this place where mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I have these beliefs, but I don't identify it in some sort of, um, like, uh, home or organized place. Where do you think yeah. the ethics of beauty has in that sort of conversation as people are trying to, um, uncover, rediscover spirituality? And I mean, obviously you, you place a lot of the the framing in the book in the orthodox church but maybe for someone who's outside of the orthodox church how do you participate like get the get the sparks to participate that if you if you don't have the trust in some bigger organization yeah yeah i mean and it's okay if you don't have a specific answer i'm just interested in your thoughts about it <laughs> you don't have to be the authority I mean, I, on it <laughs> I, I work for the organization but i, I don't i don't want to say i have trust in the organization mm. i i think what i have is a sense of my own failings and the extent to which first of all my students have been more or less forgiving uh, of my failings and mm. and given me a chance to mature mm. and i think that um you know and i and i hope that um you know they're finding the same thing because they gave that to me you know in their in their service to the church um um certain things can deaden deaden the soul and and we just want to be careful about those those ethical actions that can that can not just injure the soul but um blind it and mm -hmm. um and w when we when we encounter Christ and we encounter the holy spirit we encounter them as holy, as as holiness and their holiness, and we we naturally feel some shame about our sin, mm -hmm. and um, you know maybe it's just that, that we've been cold hearted for a long time because we just grew up on television and on a very very um cold coldness towards the suffering of others mm. and um so there's going to be some hot tears of shame you know when we <laughs> and it's not just when i mean it's it uh, when we have these moments of increased increased closeness to christ and it's it's hard mm. it's hard and i think um I, I understand that, um, and this is not the same, you know, it's thinking poorly of yourself. You mm -hmm. know, you might at the same moment be discovering that you really weren't, you know, this a worthless thing. You, you were a worthwhile thing who was acting very coldly and hurtfully to others. Mm -hmm. And... So with so within this shame is you know is is a, a regal dignity, because because you know as Father Sophroni said, you know you we we are sons and daughters of God and it's it's a and it's it's such a royal thing that mm. you know it's it really is shameful what what we've done with that you know so I guess I guess you know what what I what I would say to people is you know I always think of you know Dr. I mean uh, um Bill Wilson the the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous mm -hmm. and you know the the there was an oral tradition there and the the that he stepped into and the oral oral tradition was you know if you cannot 
beat your alcoholism through therapy, which he tried, or through hospitalization, or through religion, which he tried, then you might try asking for a spiritual awakening. And that's that's he was told that, and he was told the key thing is not to imagine what that spiritual awakening would look like, but just to persistently pray for it. Mm. And then, and then, and then he did have, and that's a beauty first kind of a thing because right. it was an openness to surprise, and that's another word for beauty: it's surprise. And it's beauty as the book used it. It's like he was open to that surprise, and it came. Right. Straight. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that framing of like beauty and surprise being um, <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's interesting because I feel like. Um, on one hand, there's this level in our culture that doesn't care much about beauty at all. And then another that has sort of this heightened sense of it, but almost an idolized version of it in a very, um, how would you say, simplistic, <laughs> not quite holistic view of beauty, where it's um, much more about appearances and um, identifying beauty on our own terms versus um, <laughs> being surprised by the things we see in the world and like, trying to reflect the beauty that we see in it. And I loved your sort of um, expression of uh, the recognition of beauty um, in the sense of being um, both the embrace of the cross, but also the resurrection. Um, can you talk a little about that and sort of um, where that idea is coming from and, and how that looks um, in patterns throughout the world? So that's that's the twofold anointing again, you know, another form of it, that when we encounter beauty, you know, it's, we're exalted, but somehow, you know, we we also become aware of our either maybe our unworthiness, maybe um our smallness. It could be different different things like that. Um or in in another sense, it it ex it gives us a feeling of exaltation great beauty but also a longing to leave ourselves behind mm. so we're kind of resurrected and dying at the same time and so so beauty can give you a really good um approximation of the twofold anointing and especially if it's spiritual beauty you know that's why you know, many times people encounter great spiritual beauty they, they literally want to leave the world everything just want to get out there's nothing they just don't want it just sickens them they don't want any of it just mm -hmm. gonna go far away um so so that duality you know is the adventure of our life and it starts with that encounter and then you know it enters into the realm of goodness whether that is analysis or it's um you know, it's, it's moral questions. Mm. And that's not truth. That's just, that's just logic. Isn't truth. Logic is it's a conceptual robot that fights other conceptual robots. You know, <laughs> it's, it's not a, it's a, it's a technology in a way, mental, yeah. mental technology. Yeah. Um, it certainly has some grounding in ultimate truth, but it's not <clears throat> the thing itself. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I find it really interesting because it feels like this idea of like, um, life and death, which is what, what, you know, in the, or at least mm. in the Orthodox frame, mm. you see that the cross as right. Like this, this battle between life and death and the idea of embracing death for, for, you know, uh, voluntarily for the hope that it produces life and, and life greater and seeing these patterns of that in the world and even in nature, right? You've got <laughs> the seasons where we go through these patterns of life and death and, um, you know, the, the hope that we're, we're moving <laughs> towards something more beautiful. And even in our modern films, like that idea of life and death is something so understandable. And, um, you know, we get a sense of it, even if we don't fully know it, that I think looking at beauty and that idea makes it a lot easier to talk about and wrestle with the idea of what is true beauty. Cause you know, with, with some of the postmodern, uh, 
thinking, yeah, the idea that beauty even has some true level to it that we can acknowledge and participate in um, can seem almost silly. <laughs> I don't know if you if you get that sense or you get that pushback sometimes when you talk about beauty. I mean, I think our, our art is seems to be being produced by traumatized people. Yeah. And w when you're traumatized and and that is not, you know, you're in that ization, you're not, you know, not just you've suffered, but you're um yeah, all anything that's all order can seem like a lie or a mockery and, and you want to smash it. Sure. Um and uh I certainly can can relate to that feeling. I can relate to that. Um, it's a troubling sign that more and more adults feel that way, or or even like culture mm -hmm. creators or artists. Like, yeah, that's a kind of feeling that someone can have at age fifteen, and 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 you know, the the uncle or the great uncle, even the grandfather, or the grandmother needs to step in and and help that child reconcile through that trauma. It is not to make a display of our traumatic states um, is hard on everyone around us. And it's not really an agent of healing. It's just mm. an agent of, you know, cultural unraveling. Yeah. Um, when we've recovered our wits a little bit, then we can see that, um, the kind of beauty that we need in art or in spirituality is this, this joyful sorrow beauty that has this ineffable blend of cross and resurrection. So if it's too pretty, if it's just too sweet, then that's an offense to the wounded. And if it's too dark, that's an offense to the resurrected. <laughs> and yeah. it has to, and it's, it's not, and civilization depends on on artists getting this blend right, mm. and we're waiting for them to do so. And I'd like to ask you, which do you have any particular? Did you have a particular film in mind when you said that you think modern film is looking at life, the life death well, cycle a little bit? Um, not not particularly, um, but you know, there's this. Um, but life and death is something so um, fundamental in so many films, but I guess if, to pick one, like, and probably the the most popular example, looking at something like the, the Marvel cinematic universe, right? <laughs> you have mm. this process of like different life and death and the, um, well, you've got a lot of like justice of like, what is justice and how we survive, but you know, looking at something like Endgame, mm. <laughs> where, you know, the, this idea of like, um, you know, is is you know killing half of life to give everybody a better life is that true life and there's this wrestling that's happening and i don't think everybody's getting the answer right to those questions in film but you just recognize that we have um some sort of a, a fascination with it or an understanding with it and um it, it does seem like in modern frame there's a lot of uh, outsourcing of death that has happened in our culture and you see it reflected in the art where <laughs> we try to avoid death or, or don't know how to process that and find ways to uh, capture life and hold on to that. Yet I don't think it always produces the most beautiful stories. And that's uh, sometimes what you're wrestling with. Like there's, um, there's a lot of people who talk about these superhero movies where when you have the character that just comes in and can destroy everything and never has a weakness, ha never has that ability to uh, face at death of any kind. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't always make the most compelling story or connect with us on a human level because there's um, yeah, there's something missing from that experience where it's like, well, we do experience that pattern of life and death in all of these little ways. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I do think we've lost that connection and that understanding of the fullness of that and the beauty of participating in that cycle. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but um, yeah, I'd have to think, I should have thought more about like a, a specific example, but. Um, 
No, no, that's that's good. I haven't seen all the Marvel movies. The it seems to me like you know you're well. I was thinking that you know Jane Jacobs' very first book was called The Death and Life of Great American Cities, and they asked her to change the title, and she said, "I I don't know why, but I can't." Mm. And they wanted a different run with a different title for the the the, the version that was printed in in England, for example. Um, but you know she was on to this cyclical nature of things. And I mean, from the other extreme, as a kid, you know, I would read about the Marines and Iwo Jima, and there was always someone was, you know, someone was always throwing himself on a grenade to save his buddies. I mean, that <laughs> sure. that really appealed to me. That was <laughs> that was my goal. That was my career goal. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it did not happen. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, like Dan, I wanted to die gloriously on the field of battle mm -hmm. with my men. But the, the um, but I think lots of people outside of a religious sphere still understand that power of sacrifice. And then as you as you grow in faith, you know, you realize that, okay, but you know, those Japanese soldiers were people too. What is going on here? And you you start to, you know, to telescope out to a larger picture of the world and you know, and of living things and you know, wanting your life or your sacrifice to somehow, you know, augment that. Mm. And then you just realize that really the, 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 um, the, uh, the enemy here, it's not a person or a party or something. It's just the mind of the machine that has affected and infected all of us. And we're just not acting like living people. Mm. And, and and this machine mind is killing life and with a cheerful face and calling it the augmentation the statistical augmentation of something mm. and everyone feels like they can't stand up to it um and And then, and then there's this this crazy like division. The things have been divided. Like conservatives, you know, in theory, ought to be in favor of life and against the machine. Right. But um, really, whom do we hear talk about those kind of things? Much much more the left. Yeah. And but the left has been completely captured in its mind by the machine of lust mm. it, it can no longer it, it will no longer permit itself the normal just the normal organic human emotions of shame around sexual life mm -hmm. and um so you have in this era, you know, you have these two great machines at war hmm. and, and, and it's, um, the prognosis is grim <laughs> yes. because it's, it's just so, you, you, yeah, you look around and you think, well, who is who or what? And you say, no one, there's really no one. I mean, there's people who read Wendell Berry. That's a hope, some hope that people read Wendell Berry or people read Jane Jacobs. That's some hope. But there's kind of no, there isn't like a unified field theory of life. And, you know, the, the machine, the machine rolls along. Hmm. <laughs> and what do you, what do you think's kind of increasing this machine mentality in humanity because i mean it's <laughs> yeah it's it's almost sort of a well it's always that tricky combination like we talk about ai right like oh is ai going to replace humanity but i think we all know there's something inherently different about humans like that a machine can't completely <laughs> replace yeah. yet there is this sort of belief that um humans can't like are just simple machines 
in, in this process? Like, where do you think that is being driven? I think, I think AI will have some real successes. Like I think sure. AI might help us to, to farm better. Like it mm. might help us, um, you know, um, Uh, certainly, I mean, if if you wanted wanted a companion book to the Ethics of Beauty, but in a much different genre, it would it might be something like um, uh, the Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist, who's this mm. Scottish or you know, British yeah. neuroscientist about brain hemispheres, and he's saying that he's saying that our as a society we're behaving as a culture as a civilization now we're behaving you know, it, at the large scale, like an individual with right hemisphere brain damage. He, a, a person who cannot think in terms of holes, can only think in terms of parts, mm. that left brain manner of thinking. And that's another way of saying that we've lost beauty first. We've mm. lost beauty. And so, so I, I don't... So clearly, like, there's pieces in place. Like, if you read McGilchrist, if you read The Ethics of Beauty, if you read Wendell Berry, if you read Wounded by Love or something, you start to, Jane Jacobs, you start to have the elements. They're, they're out there. Yeah. But we've created so many machines in, in ourselves and in our world, and that's fine, but those things don't turn on a dime. How do you redo environmental policy, industrial policy, agricultural policy. How do you look at this? Look at the whole thing with the um, cl climate change. Like, yeah. it's, again, everything is at stake according to the climate change people. Mm -hmm. But with everything at stake, everything according to them, they they couldn't, embrace nuclear power or an approach to the problem that could enlist conservatives like a, like a revenue neutral carbon tax or something mm. like what in the world at the end of the day with the whole you know biosphere hanging in the balance right <laughs> the ideology had to come first yeah you know that that's and and that's that's another example of machine mind. We just cannot think. We just don't have any common sense. What makes it so strong is that we are afraid of being powerless, mm. and we want power, power, power. We're not interested in truth or beauty. We're interested in goodness. We're interested in effectiveness. Mm. And truth first modality just. It was something the scientists and philosophers sold us on. They said, let the scientists discover truth. It's the short, it's the short path to power. Mm. And so people took that. Mm. Um yeah. <laughs> Which is so interesting. I think especially if you if you're grounded in sort of a, a Christian framework where, you know, we're called to learn how to be somewhat powerless and <laughs> be the be the suffering servant and like not chase the the power of um you know what the what the world says is powerful and in that understanding this whole different side of power right um yeah it's very interesting that it, uh, yeah i have to think about that much more in this idea of the mechanical because i i mean i went to i grew up in a very conservative christian household sort of non-denominational evangelical and then went moved to san francisco state and spent the last 10 years living in very liberal cities and working in very liberal environments and so you get these two sort of different sides of this conversation you hear the debates and <laughs> there's there there's something yeah there's something true about the loss of humanity in that where it does feel like we're in this machine <laughs> and uh yeah, they're they're very much like war machines, like rock'em sock'em robots, <laughs> and it doesn't feel like anybody's seeing each other, or recognizing the humanity of these uh, conversations, or or genuinely looking to come to solutions about answers. Um, it feels like there's this defense of a truth of a narrative that I have that I'm given that makes sense of the world to me, 
And like, I don't want to lose that. And so I, I, <laughs> I continue on the, the machine route to get there, but it's, it's so much more complicated than that. <laughs> And I, I, you know, he, here in the here in the village, you know, where, where I mean, it's not really the village. I mean, this is 2023. Um, when I first came to my dad's island in 1978, I was 11, and there were there was no electricity, or there wasn't much electricity in the village, mm. and some indoor plumbing and some not. And I think, you know, like, I don't know who had a TV. It was a TV were like in the central square, you know, the Cuff and Neon had a TV or something. Just a different world, you know. Yeah. Um, but, but, but thank God it has, that has not completely gone away. And, you know, you know, so to step down from, let's say, New York, you know, way big step down to Boston, then a kind of lateral, but still down to Athens. And then, you know, back here to the village. Right. Um, what happens as you step from the city down is that you, in, inconvenience is a lot more intractable. Intract, intractable? It's like you're intractable. You're always, like, you're often hot. You're often, you know, uh, you know, something isn't working or right. there's no drive through or there's just, there's a lot more things. And, and the, the three things that you have to get through that is you have your wits. Like you're not going to call an expert. You got to figure it out. <laughs> right. You don't know when the expert's going to come and maybe they're playing the bazooki anyway, and they don't feel like coming. <laughs> um, that's a scene from uh, Potmos, a place of healing for the soul. And that was that's what happened to the author. The expert was like, "I'm sorry, I'm just working on this chord." Um, <laughs> so, so you need to rely on your own wits, and you need to rely on on people. So it's much more about like you've got to invest in the people you love because you've got to be there for them, and they've got to be there for you. you this isn't just Google it and speak to a stranger. It's, it's really um and then the third thing is the is the supernatural you know you've got to pray a lot and i think those those three things you know are three things that people should cultivate wherever they are mm. like cultivate the supernatural cultivate invest in your neighbors invest in your family be there for them drop everything when they need you um and and you know rely a little bit more on your own own wits and not on whatever it is you know the party line or whatever but but I, I think I, I don't know it's just it's hard to see you know how things are going to go I mean we can't mm -hmm. I don't know I I, I guess what I, what I meant to say is this I think we need to pray for a spiritual renewal it's going to mm -hmm. take a miracle because the machine is just getting stronger and it's getting more violent. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's very true. I, I think it is. Maybe, maybe it's not maybe. Yeah. It's maybe, a, maybe. Yeah, yeah, what it, do you think? <laughs> it's difficult to say. Cause on one hand, that's how it feels, right? Because that's what we're being given. A lot of the media that's created is very outrage focused. And so the stories that we see that gain traction that people will put out on major networks are about the destruction and the division and all of these things. Yet um, I, I've done a lot of traveling <laughs> and it, it's funny at, at the moment, at this very moment, I'm sort of in the scaling down where I, I've lived the last 10 years in big cities. And now I live in a small city in the middle of the Netherlands <laughs> where I don't know the language and yeah, things are a lot more inconvenient and <laughs> you have to learn how to, yeah, uh, be more in your wits and, and trust people. And, you know, uh, that's the, the that it's last good, part. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> yes. It's, it's very difficult, but <laughs> it's like, I, I recognize the good in it and I, I recognize the beauty that's coming out of it. But, um, in those moments where I can, uh, you know, through, through connecting with people and seeing those things and, and trying to cultivate those connections with people wherever I was at. Um, there's, there's much more understanding and 
I think there's this movement and this disenchantment from that machine thinking that exists more, but we just don't quite know <laughs> where to plant it or or how to grow it or cultivate it more. And so, <laughs> yeah, in some ways it feels like it's both growing and waning at the same time, but in different places. Mm -hmm. And so at the extremes, they keep fueling each other more and more and more. And so <laughs> they go fighting to just like destroy, but they're somewhere in this middle that nobody's really paying attention to where all of a sudden you've got people <laughs> dropping out of that and trying to uh, get more grounded in what it is to actually be human and uh, the messiness of all of that. And so that gives me hope. <laughs> um, but what's the future of it and what it'll look like? I don't know. But um, I don't know. I think hmm. there's a lot of conversation, particularly on the political of like, oh, we have to change legislation or these bigger things. <laughs> and um, the truth is that most of us uh, don't aren't equipped to do that or have the ability to do that. And so um, in my mind, I, I, I start to think more <laughs> um, grounded of like, well, what can I do um, for my neighbor? <laughs> what can I do in my own house that creates this place where um, sort of in the Christian story, like gives us this taste of, of Eden, <laughs> that little garden where we're communing with God and um, <laughs> participating with him in life. And um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like a pattern of life and death discovering that, right? Where the things you think bring life, you realize, oh, maybe maybe it wasn't as life-giving as I can and dying to those things and mm -hmm. um, taking that. And coming into orthodoxy, it's been a big reorientation <laughs> of myself and in, in learning, basically relearning a spirituality that I was given as a kid, but in a different frame, in a different order. <laughs> and so um, there's... Um, a difficulty in it and like a frustration and there's a part of it like as a 30 year old woman being like I feel like I'm a kid again starting over <laughs> and um, I'm a I'm seven months pregnant <laughs> so I have a child coming <laughs> and so <laughs> it feels like you know this idea of like a child leading a child and trying to bring them into that but um, I don't know there's there's a beauty to it too of the recognition of like there's always going to I, I liked how you said it earlier where um, with orthodoxy is um, identifying that you don't know, but you might know a person or I think that's how you said it or, or, or something yeah. like that. <laughs> and that's how I feel like life is reoriented for me where it's, <laughs> I don't know anything, but <laughs> I want to know people. And I, I, I think I'm starting to know more of that. And even in knowing people and knowing others, I, I start to recognize and know myself more and this idea of what it really is to like embrace humanity, like the way we were supposed to be. But, uh, you know, it's who's never your, who's ending. Your favorite, who's oh. your favorite saint these days? Who's your favorite saint these days? Um, as, you, as you feel motherhood coming on here, I mean, as, as, as the day gets closer before. Yeah, well, my my uh, my patron saint is uh, Juliana Saint Juliana of Lazarevo, which her story is sort of beautiful. Um, Russian saint, she's um, sometimes called the mother of saints because several of her children became saints too. But she uh, she had this um, very beautiful story of uh, dedicating her life as a mother to a but also to asceticism and giving to the poor and creating that um, space. Um, and so I, <laughs> I look to her to try to cultivate that thing of like the life that I'm in. But, uh, one of my, one of my favorite saints is St. Mary of Egypt. Um, cause I think her story is just so beautiful in that recognition of like the life she lived is not something that we would necessarily <laughs> put as the, as the holy life, um, in, in that, you know, she, she spent <laughs> most of her life. Um, as a prostitute, yet she she came to Christ and spent her life trying to orient the 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 rest of her life in the desert trying to orient to him. And we we look at her not as uh, <laughs> something lesser than, but as something something holy. And there's that belief that nothing's irredeemable. So there's these two sides of these um, beautiful women <laughs> that. Um, I think as humanity and I think especially women nowadays, we feel so fractured and um <laughs> what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to live. And um 
I don't know, it's two sides of a womanhood that I find um, very beautiful, inspiring. Um, yeah. Can I say something about Mary of Egypt and yeah. the Beauty First Way? Um, you know, there you had a situation where, I mean, there weren't no, like, it wasn't like sermons. There wasn't analysis. There was just, she tried to enter and she encountered the, the, you know, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and she encountered the Mother of God. And yeah. um, so that was kind of beauty first moment. But within it, right, there was a moral lesson. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, a statement about the way she was living her life that had to change and that it was not right. And it was, right. that it was up. And I think, I mean, I, I suppose what we wish for people, for ourselves, is that all our encounters with the commandments should be clothed in that much beauty. <laughs> that that it, it shouldn't be someone who hates us or our enemy or someone who coldly tells us, points us, points out our faults, but someone who in great love and, and, and you know, with a kind of sorrow for us. Mm. However, <laughs> however, I... Uh, certainly one of my goals, you know, now that I've written, you know, the, the ethics of beauty and the beauty first way and understanding that that's the way it's, you know, it's ideally should be, mm. do have to, part of maturing is more and more that no matter what guys we get the good advice in, even if it's with a slap in the face, if it's good advice, if it's our life, you know, at stake, we can't say, well, I'm not going to not drive off this cliff until you say it sweetly. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> not hit the brakes. I don't care if they used, you know, a dirty word when they told you that you're heading for the cliff. You've got to hit the brakes. And so I think um, like, like you can't let the demand for a beauty first approach from others, like ruin your life. Like, right. What, whatever, whatever guys it comes in, you know, if it's what you need to hear, I think, you know, therapy can be like that. Yeah. I just don't think I'm, I'm superhuman enough to go to like 20 sessions of that. You know, just maybe one, one session of someone just telling me right in the face, you know, like, okay, thanks. You know, you know, you're not God <laughs> and you shouldn't be talking to people that way. Number one, number two, you're right. But now I need a year to think about that and implement it. You know, the, right. um, so there's there's that. I think we want we want people to grow in resilience. I just think that the more we do it, uh, adopt a beauty first approach with others, the more strength they're going to have ultimately for those times when it comes in a very unvarnished or even hurtful way. Yeah, well, I think a lot yeah. of that, a lot of it's like human dynamics, right? Where there, there's plenty of times we we say something not for the edification of someone, <laughs> but to 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 get at them, and like I don't necessarily think that's beautiful, but even in that, when I, I don't know, I, I think God's pretty economical. There are some times where, you know, being told straight well, and right. <laughs> not uh, <laughs> not not being, you know, and I'm not I'm not a very um, well, I'm a sensitive person, but I, I don't mind, a, you know, a straightforward, direct approach to things. And sometimes I'm I'm much more appreciative of someone who's willing to tell me something straight than couch it in like soft niceness. I don't think that is the fullness of beautiful. And, and that's where I think our definition and like understanding of beautiful is so complex, where it isn't it's light, very, fluffy oh, and yeah. soft always. There's there's a there's a huge dynamic in that. And, and we we start to understand that as we live through life and experience humans and all their complexity. <laughs> and, and, you know, all these things, you know, what, what I, what I try to say, if I remember at the end of ethics, not, not so much at social ethics, cause it's a different animal of a course. That's, you know, really what you see in chapter seven and eight of the book more, but mm. in, at the end of ethics, I try to say, you know, now everything you've learned, forget it, get it out of your mind. And because if you've heard it once, that anointing is always dual. If you've heard it once, that it's, you know, beauty, goodness, truth is the right progression. If you know how that corresponds, you know, to a basic curiosity about pattern, and the, you know, then now is the time. If you know that the twofold anointing feels sometimes or often like that 
bitter sweetness or mm. joyful sorrow. Now forget all that and go live your life and you will rediscover it for yourself. And I think there, there has to be in things that are true, you know, cause, cause, cause in a sense, the ethics of beauty is a novelistic book, right? Yeah. It's like, no, it doesn't tell you at the beginning that, you know, um, it does, but it doesn't like really hammer away that, well, the aesthetic sense is a cognitive sense. So in a sense, it's all truth. Um, but, you know, you get there, it, it, it guides you along. The journey is the, is the story, you know, it's, it's yeah. to transform you. But then you just have to get out there with Christ and you have to get out there with your favorite saint and you have to get out there in your life and you have to, you know, cry the tears that you're going to cry <laughs> in your life. <laughs> make, yeah. make your repentance. Yeah, I think oh, I, I love you saying like you have to go live life because I think that's been a huge problem too. We sit in our armchairs and we spin ideas and we forget, oh, hey, <laughs> isn't this supposed to help us live better? And we forget to live. And um, yeah, I think in some ways- Well, that's having a, a baby, that's, that's living. Having, yeah, having a baby. I jumped Getting in the married, deep end of the pool, baby. yeah. <laughs> Moving to a different country. Yeah, that's those are big deals. Yeah. And they, that's good. Yeah, and it's- Or J Jordan Peterson- I don't know Jordan Peterson well, but you know, for him, it's like saying yes to responsibility yeah. or these, these nice books and you know, lean in. And that's true. It's just kind of accepting. Yeah. Sorry. I cut you off. No, no, that's, uh, I was saying, yeah, it's definitely true that there's this bittersweetness in all of it <laughs> where you, where you recognize like, um, cause responsibility is not, um, <laughs> always the most, uh, comfortable thing. It stretches you, it pulls you in ways that you never expected. And then you, <laughs> you get in, into, uh, you know, places that you, you never even imagined you would yet. Um, there's like a joy in the beauty in that. And I think there's a grounding in that too, of the recognition that the more we start, um, counting others in and, and how we act and how we move, um, the better we are at, at moving for ourselves too, because it's not just about the thing that makes me happy in the moment. It's, it's the thing that brings us all better. And, um, babies are, especially for women are sort of that real splash of water and responsibility to recognize this little thing is going to rely on you so heavily for life for, uh, much longer than you can even probably imagine, but at least for like, you know, several years, like they, they can't live without you. And, um, yeah, there's, there's little things, even just being pregnant, I'm learning. And um, yeah, it's not always the the fun moments, but they're like very deep moments. And um, I, yeah, it's helped me embrace more of the simpler life. And um, yeah, and, and sort of those terms kind of get away from that machine thinking and the recognition of like, life is messy. And, you know, it's not all structured and in a flow. And sometimes the only way to learn something is to do it <laughs> but yeah 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 so, yeah well is there is there anything else that uh you wanted to add or any questions you had for me before we sort of wrap up i mean i think you know just there's this great adventure of of the life in christ and I have not really lived that adventure. I don't feel, you know, with mm. uh, sufficient courage in my own life. And I think, um, I think it's, um, we have many worries about, let's say the fate of our society, or I, you know, get frustrated about how come everyone isn't teaching chapter 22 of death and life or mm. um, the, you know, we have this words from, from Christ, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things will be added to us. And how do we seek the kingdom of God? And how do we, you know, seek its righteousness? And mm. I like what you said about your patron saint, you know, that her care for the poor, um, her care for asceticism, but she was also a mother. She had that, that kind of trifecta. And was she was she a queen or something? Is that why she was? 
She she came she, uh, from um, a wealthy family. I don't know if she was royalty, but she came from a wealthy family. And then um, uh, I think the the story goes she she I don't know if she came to Orthodox. I'm trying to remember exactly. I don't want to say the wrong thing, but she had a sort of a spiritual attack on her and was saved um, through uh, the uh, through a saint or or through um, some religious experience. And I don't know if that was her intro to Orthodoxy, but part of her story and um something really interesting about her she actually lost one of her children and um, when they were very young and she wanted to go off to a monastery and you know commit to a life of aestheticism but she had all of these children and her husband was like well <laughs> you can't do that you have to raise your children <laughs> and so what she did is raise her children and committed her life to asceticism while doing those things mm -hmm. and so there's sort of that beauty of um the uh, yeah, the complexity of the life. And there's obviously these two sides of uh, <laughs> the the orthodox way of monasticism and marriage and um, this process in which they, they teach us something about being human. And um, I don't know, I just think there's something beautiful about um, taking that aestheticism, which is generally considered sort of uh, part of the monastic life, but trying to adopt it in as much as you can in a life in the world as a married person yeah hmm. but that's beautiful it's it's a it's beautiful yeah her, her story is very interesting and I, I i need to revisit it and learn more about it um it's <laughs> i'm still so new to orthodoxy that all, all the saints there, there's so many that <laughs> trying to be patient and understanding them but um yeah that was those were some of the things that sort of, cause I probably St. Mary of Egypt was the first saint that sort of stood out to me and called to me. And, um, you know, like her story was just always so striking to me, but yeah, when it came to that, that life of, uh, what, I, what I guess I hoped for and thought the path God wanted me in, it seemed much more like, uh, St. Juliana of Lorazevo. So, um, <laughs> I try to remember that as I live and, <laughs> Uh, learn what that means because I, I mean, I definitely fail to her example. <laughs> um, but um, th there's something beautiful in the, the simplicity of it. Hmm. So, are you using an electric bike in Holland or or a, or a good old fashioned bike? I have a good old fashioned bike. Uh, it's called yeah, it's called the Old Dutch. It's got a name on it and everything. <laughs> really? Yeah. So my my um, my Dutch cousins they, they were ruining the fact that now a lot of people in Holland are switching to electric bicycles and they're like, what's the point? <laughs> yeah. Well, I I did use an electric bike. My uh, my mother in law and um, yeah, she has. They have electric bikes, so we we use them. They are very nice, especially when it's windy and you've got to go far. But no, just got a, a dinky old little $50, 50 bike. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, Holland, Holland is an amazing place for for Jane Jacobs fans. It's all, all that beautiful urbanism and yeah, it, it, it's definitely new for me. I, I've spent most of my life living in desert, so living in a place where it rains, uh, you know, more than it the sun shines is, <laughs> is different. And, you know, I've got ducks and sheep in my backyard and everything's green. And, um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's been a nice, it's been a nice place to settle down and sort of reorient myself, but <laughs> definitely a new world for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, come, come to Greece with your husband, uh, one of these days and, um, the way to do it is to to get a direct flight from Holland to one of the islands. Just skip Athens and go directly to to sort of wake up on an island. That's the way you want to do it. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. We we really want to go to Greece. My uh my husband's uh godfather is a Greek American, and he always talks about oh he's got we got to go to Greece and we got to go to these different uh, Orthodox places. So it's on our list for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well um, Cassidy, it's great talking to you. Thanks for having me on. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I, I found it really fascinating. <laughs> I did too. And I, I hope that, uh, yeah, I hope we talk again. Yeah. If you're yes. ever in Boston, you have to you have to come by the seminary with, 
I will. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you so much for watching. As always, I will close the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference.